assalamu alaikum today is the sixth day of our book read and i am narrating this book power and politics in project management by jeffrey k pinto we have already covered six chapters and the today is the sixth day and we are starting off with the seventh chapter today uh, i think we will just need two more days after today to complete this book and then we'll be done with it so let's start from the seventh chapter seventh chapter is about negotiation skills so let's see what what is there to cover this is chapter 7 negotiation skills this chapter takes an in-depth look at one of the most important and often underused resource in any project management toolkit the process of negotiation why include a chapter on negotiation in a book ostensibly aimed at project management power and politics that is a question one of the central points this book makes is what constitutes a project manager's basis for control lies in his or her ability to use influence well because formal power and its prerequisites is frequently denied them many project managers have made their careers out of cultivating and becoming adept at less formal methods of power political behavior and various influence tactics negotiation is a process predicated on a project on a manager's ability to use influence and politics productively the essence of negotiation requires there be no formal method for either side using power for conflict resolution as a result the more project managers know about negotiation and the better they become at the process the greater their influence skills are likely to become if we we are honest with ourselves many of us will admit that we are pretty lousy negotiations we are either impatient stubborn narrow minded short sighted take all objections personally or some combination of all of those americans in particular have developed an unenviably bad reputation as negotiators stories to reinforce this seeming inability are legion for example the american optical firm that negotiated itself out of several million dollars in licensing fees because negotiators mistook the silence of their japanese counterparts following their bid his was the far hostility it is ironic that we have such a weak reputation when we engage when we engage in negotiations today determining mutually agreeable bed times with our children deciding where to go for dinner and when our teenager must be home are all examples of negotiation project managers in particular understand the importance of negotiation skills because so much of their corporate life is spent in negotiations of one type or another indeed some have termed stakeholder management as effective and constant mutual negotiation across multiple parties project managers negotiate for additional time and money to prevent excessive interference and specification changes from clients important project team personnel functional managers and so forth negotiation is the art of influence taken on its highest level table 7.1 on the next page i'll just show you gives five key to, keys to developing a rational systematic program for negotiating rather than relying on ad hoc spur of the moment tactics as we approach each new negotiation let me just flash it to you right in front of you we have got developing negotiation instincts table 7.1 first is avoid confrontations prematurely digging your heels in encouraging uh, in encourages the other side to do some to the same keep your options open number 
cast your negotiating team carefully. Select the right mix of people for your team. Remember to pick one spokesperson and stick with that person. Number three, check your emotional baggage at the door. Negotiate using reason, not emotion. Keep a close watch on your blood pressure. Number four, remember the competition. Being too intransigent will encourage your opponent to explore other options, including your competitors. Number five, use candor. Nothing is quite so disarming as the willingness to stale your position clearly and demonstrate an awareness of the other side's interest. This is adopted from MH McCormack 1989, but they still don't teach in Harvard Business School, New York Bantam. Coming back to where we left. This chapter develops a systematic program for negotiating. It suggests a framework for better understanding the nature of the negotiation process, who should be involved, under what circumstances will negotiation work or not work, what must we keep, must we keep in mind throughout the negotiation process. All of these questions are fundamental to our becoming better, more influential. <laughs> I'm sorry for the disturbance. Okay, when to negotiate? The first question, when should we negotiate, asked us to consider when a negotiation meeting is appropriate to solve inherent differences. There are three primary criteria that must be satisfied for a negotiation to be warranted and potentially fruitful. Briefly, these are when, number one, there are no gross power differences. Number two, you want what they have and vice versa. Number three, there are no limiting constraints like time, geography, legal constraints, or competitive information. The first criteria, no gross power differences, implies two parties enter the negotiation with relatively similar standing, that is, neither party has the ability to hold a gun to the head of the other. For example, many of us feel a negotiation between ourselves and the internal revenue service, revenue service is something less than a fully reasoned or equitable debate. IRS has too much power to make more than a token effort at pretending to consider our wishes. Likewise, in the days before base, baseball free agency, Okay, uh, baseball free agency, players of even the highest caliber typically had little bargaining power versus the owners who could dictate salaries, bonuses, and working con conditions to players who had no choice but to accept it. In a true negotiation, there is no obvious gross power differential that would render the negotiation farcical. Rather, both parties have relatively similar standing such a project manager and a functional manager who must negotiate a subordinate's work. Time are a departmental department's log logistical support for the project. Under these circumstances, neither party can dictate the process, but both must come together to mutually solve a problem or arrive at an agreement. The second criteria for a negotiation refers to the obvious both parties have something that the other party seeks. Whether it is money, resource, or the peace and quiet to be left alone, this second criteria adds the value element to the negotiation process. It is only when two parties perceive a sense of value in adopting or seeking the other party's position that there is any motivation to engage in negotiations in the first place. Members of the 1996 Olympic Site Selection Committee, for example, sought a location offering modern amenities, easy access, good infrastructure, sports facilities, and hotels. Atlanta's political and business communities perceived the status of hosting the Summer, summer Olympic in terms of stature and revenues for the city. Both parties clearly had what the other sought, and the negotiation resulted in a mutually satisfactory outcome. The third criteria refers to limiting characteristics such as time, 
constraints, distance, legal difficulties, communication snuffers. Our negotiation, in order to be effective, must be perceived as operating free and clear from any external pressures. Many successful negotiations occur under conditions of relative secrecy, such as settling terms for the acquisition of one company by another. One, on the other hand, consider one of the standard ploys used by both parties in the 1994 labor negotiations for major league baseball. In this case, each side, owners and players, attempted to turn up the heat on the other by implying that if their offers were not accepted by a fixed date, games would not be played. It is instructive to observe the results of these arbitrarily imposed deadlines. In neither case did the other party cave in, rather the baseball season was suspended and ultimately cancelled. Questions to ask prior to the negotiation. Anyone entering a negotiation needs to consider three salient questions prior to adopting a negotiation strategy. These questions are, number one, power. How much do I have? Number two, time. What sort of pressures are there? Number three, trust. Do I trust my opponent? The first two questions require a realistic self-assessment concerning power and any limiting constraints, and the answers are absolutely vital prior to sitting down to negotiate. These answers will show the negotiators where they are strong and most important, where they are weak. The consulting client once related the following story. It was early in June and we were involved in the second week of pretty intense negotiations and with a vendor for site considerations before starting our construction project. Unfortunately, the vendor discovered that we do our accounting books on a fiscal basis pending June 30th and he figured correctly that we were desperate to record the deal prior to the end of the month. He just sat on his hands for the next 10 days by just 21st and my boss was having a heart attack about locking in the vendor. Finally, we practically crawled back to the table in late June and gave him everything he was asking for in order to record the contract. This example illustrates the dangers of having an incomplete understanding of factors that can severely limit one's ability to negotiate successfully. How much power do you have going into the negotiation? Remember, one is not necessarily looking for a dominant position, but a defensive one. That is, one from which the other party cannot dominate. Likewise, are there any pressing time constraints limiting your freedom? to effectively negotiate, the calendar can be difficult to overcome. So, two can be domineering boss who is constantly saying, solve the problem with R&D, marketing, or whomsoever. Once words get out of that, there is time constraint. Just watch your opponent slow down the pace, reasoning correctly that you will have to agree sooner or later, and to, the, to this, to his terms, not yours. The final and most compelling question to consider is also the most fundamental. Do you trust the other party? Are they people of this, their word or do they have reputation for changing agreements after the fact? Is their word their bond? Is, are they forthcoming with accurate information? Do they play hardball in negotiations? Not all of the above questions indicate someone is untrustworthy. Indeed, it is appropriate to play hard by hardball on occasion. The essential question being asked here is whether or not you can sit across a table from your opponent and believe you both have a professional vested interest in solving a mutual problem in a non predatory manner. If the answer is no, it is unlikely that you will negotiate with enthusiasm or openness towards the other party. Once these three questions have been answered, honestly, the ch chances of engaging the productive and mutually satisfying negotiation are much greater. Figure 7.1, which I will just be showing you, illustrates the starting point from which most negotiations invariably proceed. This figure demonstrates the room for bargaining, the negotiation space that exists between 
two opposing viewpoints in this case the negotiation is relatively simple in that it covers one topic money the opposing positions held by your company and the contractor hinge on determining how much the contractor is willing to pay your company for work to be done the negotiation space for this particular scenario focusing on your goals of securing as much money as possible from the contractor who likewise is interested in paying as little as possible certainly other situations would have more complex negotiating space to take into consideration this model is instructive nevertheless because it is a common situation and well will serve as a point of reference to examine some important and useful tips for effective negotiations so looking at the diagram company's target is you see on the top well, it is between 1 million and uh, like 1.4 million company's cut off point the least you will take is 1.45 million on the other hand company's cut off point for the most they will pay is 1.65 and contractor's target what you would like contractor wants to be paid around 1.8 million so the decision the mutual decision should be somewhere in between 1.45 and 1.65 next topic is tips for effective negotiation one of the most influential books on negotiation in recent years is getting to yes by roger fisher and william ure they offer terrific advice on principled negotiation the art of getting agreement with the other party while maintaining a principled win win attitude here we offer project managers specific advice on effective negotiating strategies through fisher and ure's framework applying their advice to project related examples number 1 separate the people from the problem one of the most important profound and yet common sense ideas of negotiation is just this negotiations are people first negotiators are no different than anyone else in terms of ego attitudes biases education experiences and so forth we all react negatively to direct attacks we all become defensive at unwarranted charges and acquisitions and we particularly novice negotiators tend to personalize opposing view points feeling objections are aimed at us rather than at the position we represent even the most seasoned negotiators <coughs> find it difficult to keep cool in the face of withering personal attacks or unfair charges consequently we must seek ways in which we can keep people their personalities defensiveness egos etc out of the problem itself the purpose of negotiation is to fix the problem not the blame the more we focus on the issues that separate us and less attention to the people behind the issues the greater the likelihood of achieving a positive negotiated outcome in seeking ways to separate the people from the problem there are some important guidelines we must consider so within this this uh, uh, example we will talk about a number of guidelines number one guideline within it is put yourself in their shoes this is also called empathy <clears throat> an old cliche reminds us to never judge another person until we have walked a mile in their shoes there is a great deal of validity in the notion that we can never come to a meeting of the minds with another party until we conscious consciously consider them and their positions head on a great starting point in negotiations it is to discuss not only your position but understand the other party's position early in the negotiation process it has a wonderfully disarming effect on your opponent and trends across the bargaining table when they hear you outline as objectively as possible not only you your needs but your understanding of their needs as well when the other party hears a reasoned discussion of both positions two important events occur number 1 a basis of trust is established 
because your opponent discovers a willingness to openly discuss perceptions in the beginning. And number two, the negotiation is reconstructed as a win-win rather than a winner-take-all exercise. Second point here is don't deduce their intentions from your fears. A common side effect of almost all negotiations, particularly early in the process, is to construct supporting stereotypes of the other side. We know how this works. When we sit down with the accountant to negotiate additional funding for the project, we invariably adopt a mindset in which all accountants are benefiting being counters who are waiting for the opportunity to pull the plug. But what is happening here, even before the meeting takes place, we have developed an image of the accounting department and its mindset based on your fears rather than on an objective reality. You assume they will act in certain ways, subconsciously begin negotiating with them as though money is their stolen concern, sole concern. And before you know it, have created an opponent based on your worst fears. The point is to shed preconceived notions of the character and position of the other party prior to the negotiation. Otherwise, the negotiation is likely to begin with a mythical beast representing your worst fears rather than the someone who has a reasonable opposing position. Further, as the negotiations proceed, you will continue to put the worst possible interpretation on their actions, constantly waiting for the other party to begin to act in ways that support your initial stereotypes. Next is, don't blame them for your problems. Blaming is an easy trap to fall into, particularly if you believe the other party is at fault for your difficulties. Nevertheless, in negotiations, it is almost always counterproductive <coughs> to initiate a finger-pointing episode. Remember, negotiator, negotiators are people first. When you blame them, for your problems, even if you believe it is justified, it only serves to cause them to dig their heels in and become recalculant. Find ways to diffuse this potential defensiveness. Suppose that a company has just developed a new software program for internal reporting and control that continually crashes. One approach is for the exasperated accounting manager to call in the head of the software development project and Chew them out. Your program really stinks. Every time you claim to have fixed it, it dumps us, dumps on us again. If you don't get the bugs out of it, within two weeks, we are going to go back to the old system and make sure that everyone knows the reasons why. While it, might, it may be satisfying, satisfying for the accounting manager to vent his anger like this, it is likely to be to do little to solve the problem particularly in terms of relations with the software development project team. A far better approach would have been less confrontational, framing the problem as a mutual issue that needs correction. For example, the reporting program crashed again in mid-stride. Every time it goes down, my people have to re-input the data and use up time that, would, that could be spent in other ways. I need your advice on how to fix the problem with the software. It is just not ready for beta testing and we uh, are we using it incorrectly or what? In this case, the head of the accounting department is careful not to point fingers. He refrains from simply setting blame and de demanding correction and instead treats the problem as a problem that will require cooperation if it is to be resolved. Next is recognize and understand emotion, theirs and yours, both. <clears throat> it is easy to get emotional during the course of negotiation, but resist the impulse. It is common in a difficult, protected negotiation for emotions come to the surface. You may be angry or frustrated by the tactics and attitudes of the other party. Nevertheless, it is usually not a good idea to respond in an emotional way even when the other party becomes emotional. They may be intentionally using emotion as a tactic to get you to lose your cool and allow your heart to guide your 
had always a dangerous course. Emotions are a natural side effect of lengthy negotiations. Understand precisely what is making you angry, stressed, or tense. Be astute about enough to take note of the emotions emanating from your opponent and be aware if you are doing something that is making the other person upset or irritable. A useful technique in negotiation is to allow the other party to let off the steam at various times as a negotiation grows more intense or heated so too do the emotions and those sitting around the table. Giving your opponent the opportunity to blow up and tell you off does not mean you are surrendering anything in terms of the main issues for negotiation. Rather, it is your acknowledgement that other less seasoned negotiators sometimes react viscerally to continued intra intra uh, intransigences. In using a policy of principled negotiation, you are holding out for the best terms you can achieve. So is your opponent letting off steam may make it easier to talk rationally later. Further, as a face saving gesture, the occasional blow up can help the other negotiator convince his or her con constituency that they are being as tough as they can be clearing the stage for later more reasoned discussions. How are you to react to these blow ups? First, keep your cool. Some negotiators have made a lucrative living out of goading the other party into an exchange of invective, knowing an emotional negotiation is never as productive as a reasoned one. Recognize this tactic. Is your opponent a needler hoping to find the button that sets you off? If so, you now have an advantage because you recognize their principal negotiating tactic. The story is told of former U.S. Speaker of the House, Thomas Reed, who was often vilified during congressional sessions by opponents. Even in the midst of the most inflammatory rhetoric, Reed was never seen to respond with anything other than a grave and formal courtesy. At night, however, after the sessions were finished for the day, he would often sit trembling and red-faced with rage as a result of the emotions that he had managed to keep bottled up during the day. Remember that the other side has a vested interest in getting and keeping you angry. Next is listen actively. Very important point. Active listening means more than sitting quietly and allowing the other party to voice their position. Most of us know from experience when people are really listening to us and when they are simply going through the motions. In the later case, your frustration at their seeming indifference is a tremendous source of ne negative emotion. For example, consider a client negotiating for a performance enhancement on a soon to be released piece of manufacturing equipment. The project manager want wanted to leave the project alone because any reconfigurations at this point would delay the release of the final product. Every time the client voiced their issues, the project manager spoke up and said, I hear what you are saying. But it actually, it quickly became clear the project manager did not in fact hear a word the client was saying, but was paying lip service to their concerns. Eventually, the client went behind the project manager's back to top management and won approval of for the specification changes, delaying the project and poisoning the relationship with the project manager and his team. Active listening means working hard to understand not just the words, but the underlying motivations of the other party. One effective technique involves interrupting occasionally to ask a pointed question. As I, for example, as I understand it, then you are saying blah, blah, blah. Tactics such as this convince your opponent you are trying to hear what is being said rather than adhering to your company's position, no matter what arguments or issues were raised. Demonstra demonstrating that you are clearly, you clearly understand the other party's position is not the same thing as agreeing with it. There may be many points with which 
to make to take issue nevertheless a constructive negotiation can only proceed from the point of point of complete and objective information not from preconceived notions or entrenchment and intransigent positions next point under the same heading is build a working relationship again very important one long term relationships are key to effective negotiations obviously not every negotiation will occur with another party with whom you have or desire a long term relationship nevertheless the idea is still important think of long term relationships are those with individuals or organizations we value and hence are inclined to work hard to maintain the stronger the working relationship the greater the level of trust likely to permeat its character for example consider relationships among sports agents and owners of various teams while professional affiliations require each to adopt adversarial roles outside of these roles many of these individuals maintain cordial sometimes friendly relations with one another understand the difference between personal and business relationships while acknowledging that the healthier the personal or working relationship the more likely professional contacts are to be most more positive and mutually satisfying even in the midst of protected negotiations so this all i was explaining for the main heading separate the people from the problem so we had put yourself in their shoes we had don't deduce their intentions from your fears don't blame them for your problem recognize and understand emotions and effectively and finally build a working relationship the second point under the tips of effective negotiation is focus on interests not positions there is an important difference between positions each party adopts and the interests that underscore and mold those positions in this context interest means the fundamental motivations that frame each party's position as fisher and uri note interest define the problem it is not the position taken by each party that shapes the negotiation nearly as much as it is the interests that are source of fear needs and desires recall that figure 7.1 the position of the contractor is to play hardball hoping to get the company to do a job for something okay for something less than 1.65 million and although the contractor does not know this the company will not even consider the job for less than 1.45 million these are opposing positions however they do not tell tell us anything about the interest driving the positions for example rather than focusing on the contractor's desire to get the job done for some somewhere between 1.25 to 1.45 million the company's ne negotiators need to examine the motivation behind this position that is the contractor's interest likewise what are the company's major interests shaping its negotiating position interest rather than positions form the heart of any negotiation why look for underlying interests as opposed to focusing on the positions that are on the table certainly it is far easier to negotiate with another party from the point of your position versus theirs however there are compelling reasons why focusing on interest rather than positions offer an important leg up in successful negotiation first unlike positions for every interest there are usual several alternatives that can satisfy it the major interest of the company in figure 7.1 is to ensure it will be in business for many years with this awareness company negotiators can look for solutions other than squeezing every drop of profit out of the contractor for example they could enter into a long term relationship with the contractor in which the company forgoes some profit on this job while locking the contractor into a sole source agreement for the next 3 years the contractor would then receive the additional profit from the job by paying less than the company desires but ensure long term work its interest 
another reason for focusing on interest in is that negotiating from positions often leads to roadblocks as each party tries to find their opponent's cutoff position while conceding their own. We consume valuable time and resources in posturing our various positions while hiding as long as possible our true intentions. In focusing on interest, on the other hand, we adopt a partnering mentality that acknowledges the legitimacy of both sides' interests and seek solutions that will be mutually satisfying. Some important points about interest include number one, identifying interest. Ask why and why not. <clears throat> Put yourself in the other party's shoes for each position they take. Ask yourself why. What is the underlying interest served by adopting that position? Likewise, when confronted with the other side's position, it is usually helpful to dissect them asking why not for each potential alternative why are they adopting the attitude they have chosen of course the easiest method for identifying interest is by asking the other party in as direct and non-threatening a manner as possible what their major concerns and interests are when one party is willing to share their interests in advance with the other party it is likely that a mutually agreeable set of alternatives will be generated next point under the same is the most powerful interest are basic human needs remember that underlying much of the initial bargaining and negotiation posturing is a simple tenet human needs define interest needs as defined by Maslow Alderfer and others include issues like recognition safety and security a sense of belonging and acceptance and control over one's life do these issues define the method used by many negotiators absolutely consider that for many negotiators assessing how well they did in a particular negotiation is typically framed as a win-lose proposition does the contractor want to want the extra fifty thousand dollars he can squeeze out of the company certainly in terms of economic self-interest the firm may need the contractor defines himself in terms of the, his ability <coughs> to be treated <coughs> as an equal partner with others large firms. therefore in deciding uh, deciding to play hardball over the extra fifty thousand dollar the company may be complete misunderstanding the contractors need to be treated with respect company sees this as a money issue while the contractor views it as an equity issue refusing to budge on an extra fifty thousand dollar may fuel his feelings of inferiority and cause entrenchment to an equally intransigent position guaranteeing long and potential fruitless negotiation next is acknowledge their interests as part of the problem do not treat others self-interest as peripheral to the issue at hand rather be willing to address them head-on in such a manner that the other party feels that you are truly making an effort to be even-handed in acknowledging contrasting views for example if it may be entirely appropriate for the project manager to sit down with a client and say as i understand it your interests are primarily to get this project delivered to your site by the end of the next month in order to make your major to meet your major milestones do i understand your interests correctly is there anything else i need to be aware of in framing questions along these lines You give the other party the opportunity to number one correct faulty interpretations. If I have said something wrong, they can correct me. Number two, share additional important interests, and number three, understand that you are trying to include their vital interests into any deal worked out. You will often be amazed as how quickly and positively another party will respond to your candor 
particularly if you are willing to share some of your interest with them. Third point is invent options for mutual gain. This is the main, main point. And we have got a number of points under this. Invent options for mutual gain. In classes on negotiation skills, one of the questions frequently asked is, what prevents us from looking for a win-win outcome? Typically, there are some basic responses that emerge which closely mirror those uncovered by Fisher and Uri. They include, number one, premature judgment. We quickly arrive at conclusions about the other side and anything they say usually serves to solidify our impression. Further, rather than seek to broaden our options early in the negotiation, we typically go the other direction and put limits on how much we are willing to give up. How far we are willing to go. Every premature judgment we make limits our freedom of action and turns and puts us deep deeper into an adversarial winner loser exchange second part second is searching for the best answer a common error made by unskilled negotiators is to assume the buried underneath that buried underneath the rhetoric and posturing is one best answer in reality most negotiations particularly if they are to result in a win-win outcome require us to broaden our search not limit and focus it. Remember, most of us define the best answer to mean the best for me, not for the other party. We prefer to think in absolute terms rather than recognizing that all problems lend themselves to multiple solutions. Indeed, it is through those multiple solutions that we are most likely to attain one that is mutually satisfying. The assumption of fixed pie. In concert with the errors generated by searching for the best answer in the assumption that there is a fixed set of alternatives available, here we lock into a I win, you lose scenario that guarantees hardball negotiating in which no ground is given nor asked. Thinking that solve their problems is their problem. Negotiation breeds egocentrism. The greater the belief that negotiations consist of simply taking care of yourself, the greater the likelihood you will be unwilling to engage in any win-win solution. Why should you? The attitude is one of pure self-absorption. At the same time, you have little interest in acknowledging whether or not the other party has any legitimacy in their position. Ultimately, it is entirely up to them to get what they can from the negotiation, just as you are seeking to get everything you can. If these are common problems that prevent win-win outcomes, what can be done to improve the negotiation process? There are some important guidelines as we can use to strengthen the relationship between the two parties and improve the likelihood of positive outcomes options to consider when searching for win-win alternatives include use positive and inclusive brainstorming broaden your options identify shared interests the use of positive and inclusive brainstorming implies that once a negotiation process begins during its earliest phase we seek to include the other party in a problem solving session to identify alternative outcomes this approach is a far cry from the typical tactic of huddling amongst ourselves to plot negotiation strategies to use against the other team. In involving the other party in a brainstorming session, seek to convince them that you perceive the problem as a mutually solvable one requiring input and creativity from both parties. Inviting the other party to a brainstorming session of this type has a powerfully disarming effect on their initial defensiveness. It demonstrates that you are interested not in beating them, but in solving the problem. Further, it reinforces the necessity of separating the people from the problem. In this way, both parties work in cooperation to find a mutually satisfactory solution that also serves, as, serves to strengthen their personal relationship. 
The concept of broadening option is a direct offshoot of the notion of brainstorming. One principal reason for your inability to develop win-win outcomes is due to our natural tendency to narrow the scope of possible outcomes. Usually in terms of our winning and the other party losing, broadening options require us to be open to alternate positions and can be a natural result of focusing on interest rather than positions. The more the other party interests are understood and more willing you are to dissect yours, the greater the probability that together you can create a range of options broader than those you were initially tempted to lock yourself into. A third technique for improving changes for win-win outcome is to identify shared interests. A common negotiating approach of experienced bargainers is to table the large items to a later point in the negotiation, focusing instead on minor and peripheral issues that are more easily solved. After working together, identifying shared interests and gaining some confidence from working in a collaborative way, it is possible to reintroduce the major points. By this time, both sides have begun to develop a working rhythm and a level of harmony, making it easier to look for shared interests within these larger issues. Number four tip is insist on using objective criteria. Fisher and Nuri noted that one of the best methods for ensuring that a negotiation proceeds along substantive lines is to frame the discussion around objective criteria. Don't get bogged down in arguing perceptions or subjective evaluations. A project manager, for example, recently almost had his project scuttled because of protracted negotiations with a client over delivering an acceptable working prototype. The project manager had a far different interpretation of the word acceptable than that of the client. The project manager assumed acceptable included normal bugs and teething problems while the client used the word to imply error free. In their desire to pin the onus of responsibility to the other, neither would back away from their interpretation of the nebulous term acceptable. Objective data and other measurable criteria often form the best basis for accurate negotiations when firms or individuals argue costs, prices, hours of available work, etc. They are using established standards and concepts both parties can understand with a minimum of interpretation error. The more nebulous the terms used are, the more subjective the language, the greater the potential to be arguing at cross purposes. Uh, within this point, we have developed fair standards and procedures. Whatever standards are used as the basis of the negotiation need to be clearly spelled out and put in terms equally meaningful to both parties. This is particularly relevant in cross-cultural negotiations where language and cultural differences often attach different meaning to common English terms on American concepts. Several American construction firms, including Bechtel Corporation, for example, recently lodged a protest against a number of Japanese firms for collusion in dividing up biddable contracts, bid rigging prior to a major airport pocket project in Tokyo Bay. The Japanese companies argued they were fulfilling the terms of recent free competition agreement by allowing Bechtel to submit a bid further in Japanese society there is nothing inherently illegal or unethical about engaging in this form of bid rigging. Clearly, both parties had very different interpretation of fair and clear bidding practices. Fair standards and procedures require that both parties come together and negotiate from the same basic understanding of the terms, concepts, common practices and liabilities. In project management, this is particularly relevant because construction contracting requires a universally understood set of terms and standards when the two parties are engaged in negotiating from the point of appropriate standard it eliminates the source of many potential misunderstandings or misinterpretations don't buy the it's 
company policy lie. Many times in negotiations, opponents fall back on the sorry, but it is company policy lie. What these people are attempting to do is create a fall guy that lets them off the hook while attempting to win points at your expense. This appeal is often false or overblown. Your best defense against the use of it's the company policy is to restate as reasonably as possible the central points to your argument. Typically, those who resort to this move are tacitly acknowledging they cannot hope to match you in a state exchange of objective information. So they are hoping to sidetrack you with a delaying move. In essence, this argument can be restated as don't waste my time with valid arguments. I'd like to help you, but I can't. In combining the company policy approach, your best weapon is a complete understanding of the options available. If your opponent, opponent is the only source for a resource you need, you have a greater lever to use against you. The more options at your disposal, however, the greater your ability to skirt the company policy line. Consider a supply company that refused to negotiate with contractors for lower prices on bulk shipments of building material, arguing that it was contrary to company policy. To even consider offering price breaks, a local contractor did some checking and discovered other sources of the material within easy driving distance and casually dropped a competitor name at a price negotiation meeting. That same afternoon, the contractor received a telephone call from the president of the supply company promising to set up a special pricing arrangement. Dealing with problem negotiators, that's the next big topic. One question frequently asked is what to do when the other party is not playing the same set of principled rules you are using. In other words, how do we deal with the dirty tricks and problems from negotiators from the other side. The goal here is not to teach a set of negotiation ploys and gimmicks the reader can use in a manipulative way, but rather to make a reader aware of these tricks, how to recognize their use and how to counter them, trying to bring the other party up to your level rather than sinking to theirs. There are a number of dirty tricks or examples of negotiation hardball. Not all of these examples offer the same degree of nastiness. Some, in fact, are simply legitimate if hard-nosed negotiation tactics that does not make them any easier to deal with, but it should not suggest that your is somehow unprincipled. Let us examine some classic negotiation ploys and what appropriate responses to them might be. Extreme demand. Many people adopt the philosophy that to get what they want, they need to first aim for the stars. Then in backing away from these initial seemingly ridiculous positions, they believe that they are more likely to get what they really wanted in the first place. This tactic, while common, can be risky if the initial extreme demand is so off-putting to the other party that they no longer believe a negotiated solution is possible Negotiator who use this tactic will typically seek to justify it even with specious reasoning rather than driving an arbitrary stake in the ground. In responding to extreme demands, it is important for not to attack the demand itself. Remember, attack the problem, not the position. A high, highly effective technique for dealing with extreme demands is to first ask the other party to fully justify their reasoning for adopting this position. Try and under, uncover logic that underlies their demand. One of the two things usually happens at this point. Either the other party cannot justify the demand beyond the fact that it is extreme and they are hoping for the best, or in explaining their reasoning, you will be able to uncover and expose some error in calculation or judgment that they have committed. Contrast the following exchanges in terms of which is likelier to lead to a successful win-win settlement. First approach, contractor is saying, 
I will need a minimum of two million dollars in order to do that job effectively. Company, that's ridiculous. I don't know where you pulled that number from, but it's way out of line. There is no way we would go half that far. Second approach. Contractor said, I will need a minimum of minimum of two million dollars in order to do that job effectively. Company says, as I understand it, pouring the footings and foundations on a square footage, footage basis works out to about $725,000. Could you show me your figures as I can see how you came to $2 million? So you see, objective, rather than fighting with the guy, you have to come up with some figures. The second scenario, the company negotiator has done the homework and is trying to work with the contractor in a collaborative manner while not giving in. This person has demonstrated they want to solve the problem with the contractor, not in spite of the contractor setting the stage for future negotiations instead of solidifying opposing positions and encouraging both parties to take in. Next is escalating demands. A common variant of the extreme demands ploy is to raise the ante every time two parties are getting close to agreement. This tactic typically only works when one party perceives the other is more anxious to conclude the negotiation than they are. They reason that by stalling and raising demand, they can continue to wring additional concessions from their opponent. A good example of this occurred in Paris during the negotiations to end the Vietnam War. U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and Lee Dacroto, the head negotiator for North Vietnam, went through several meetings in which one or the other would offer hope of a quick settlement and then pull the offer back while raising the stakes and demands. This approach only works when one party perceives that time is there a lie. And the longer they draw out the negotiation, the more concessions they are likely to get. In dealing with escalating demands, the best defense is to avoid giving the impression that you are time bound. Whether it is true or not, if the other part, other side believes time is working to their advantage, they will exploit this tactic Good negotiators counter escalating demands by allowing adequate time to negotiate while sticking to their positions despite the rising demand of the other party. Develop a negotiation protocol early in the process, engaging in mutual brainstorming sessions and setting standards to appropriate negotiation behaviors and unacceptable responses. Also, develop a good working relationship with the lead negotiator for the other side and work to lead or head off attempts to raise the stakes throughout the process. Then we have lock-in tactics. Lock-in tactics represent your opponents adopting a very public and absolute position at the start of the negotiation. They are gambling that in putting themselves into a position from which they cannot retreat, you will be forced to back, back down and make concessions. A good example of a lock-in tactic is a labor negotiator promising to take nothing less than 10% raise for his constituency, knowing that in making a public pledge, he creates a boundary around his ability to maneuver. Lock-in tactics are dangerous for a couple of reasons. First, they potentially create bad feelings between you and your opponent. The other side resents being placed in the, in the role of a spoiler, particularly when you have defined the terms of the negotiation. Second, it is high risk strategy. A clever and intractable opponent may call your bluff. You are faced with the equally unpleasant option of caving in, which destroys your credibility or continuing to stand firm while hoping to, hoping the other side is also bluffing. How do you respond to lock-in tactics? First, recognize the ploy and absolutely refuse to address the commitment itself. The more the lock-in is de-emphasized, either through humor or reason, the easier it is for the other party to back down with minimal loss of face. 
Many people, however, make it a policy to never yield to pressure, feeling that once they gave in, they encourage additional lock-in efforts. President George Bush adopted a lock-in strategy with his infamous Read My Lips pledge regarding new taxes. Less than three years later, he was forced to accept a large tax hike and the bad press that came with backing away from his pledge. Skilled negotiators sought ways to redirect the bargaining process away from the pledge itself. During the actual negotiations, little was mentioned about the lock-in pledge to give the president maximum room to maneuver. In this case, however, he played directly into the hands of his political opponents who, while making the actual decision easier, crowed publicly about it afterward. I think we are done with one hour, so I will not like to move on. We will finish this chapter tomorrow, although there are only few pages left, but still uh, it is enough that we cannot finish today anyways. I need half half an hour more to finish it. But anyways, so let's call, call it quits. This was the sixth, sixth day. Uh, I think we have covered 80% of the book already and uh, there is not much left. Two more days and we are done. Uh, so far, we have got uh, three people sitting here. Uh, Khalid Sultan, Vakar and Vakas. Any any comments, anybody? I'm opening your mics. Give uh, Vakas, Vodi. Sir, the negotiation capital type you depend on the manner of the experience. It depends on the situation of this type of people. Sometimes I feel the winning, the way you are saying that there is a tactic there, how to deal with the people, winning very uh, politely or something. Mm -hmm. But mostly I feel the people, this guy is a like dominating guy, or okay, we have to accept his uh, powers or something. But if the, the guy is very polite or very smooth in the meeting, mm -hmm. then they are taking very easy to him. Oh, this guy, okay. okay. Oh, the meaning that I feel I mean, in uh, practical, let's go here. What do you say? But again, Bhatti, I keep Gato Hambatani Koshkare, we have to understand a Mukti Floy Lakaja Kahonge, Kailok sweet talk Kerte Hapko, Apko understand Kerti, Yame, Kahaka Pokare, Kuchro, Ekdam, but a hard stance Lilate, or Apko under pressure Laniki Koshkarte. Apne Yuchis Amne Abita Padi or Kutura portion Baki beer, Usme the Kriban, Abdu the Kingeke. हर डायमेंशन को कवर इसने किया है छोड़ा कुछ नहीं है तो मतलब आई एग्री विद यू कि मतलब ये तो केस टू केस डिपेंड करता है लेकिन जो नॉलेज हम गेन करते हैं ये हमें गाइड करता है कि जिस सिनेरियो में मैं बैठा हुआ हूं उसमें मैं कौन सा वाला तरीका इस्तेमाल करूं तो इन चीजों को समझना अच्छी बात है ये मतलब एक बड़ा आला बात है हमारे लिए कि हम पढ़ तो पावर एंड पॉलिटिक्स रहे हैं और उसमें पूरी नेगोशिएशन के ऊपर हमें इतनी तफसील में चीजें मिल गई Otherwise, negotiation pe alag kitab padne padni padti hai. Jee jnaat. Thank you so much uh, for this explanation. Or a core question is that mera uh, not related to this book. Uh, last time, I have asked a question about PMP ACP. In that, uh, uh, is it mandatory to PMP is the last time to be the first time or ACP we can do? नहीं कोई कंडीशन नहीं है कोई भी सर्टिफिकेशन आप कर सकते हैं कोई वो प्री रिक्वायरमेंट कोई नहीं आप एसीपी करें ना करें डायरेक्टली पीएमपी कर लें आपकी मर्जी जी वकार एनी कमेंट फ्रॉम योर साइड नहीं सर अस्सलाम वालेकुम सर इट्स फाइन ये जो टेक्निक्स नेगोशिएशंस की हैं अगर ये सही तरीके से इस्तेमाल की जाए तो इट विल बी very uh, useful uh, in in the practical life so Bilkul. it's good sir man main khud seekh raha hu ji bahut si cheeze jo hum ignore karte hain galtiyon ka pata chalta hai ji sir ji sir khayal rakha le khalid sultan any comments 
ठीक है खालिद भाई कोई कमेंट्स हैं आर शुड बी कॉल कॉल इट अ डे चलें जी आई थिंक वी हैव डन आर जॉब हम थोड़ा फाइव मिनट ओवर शूट भी कर गए क्वेश्चन के चक्कर में बट एनी वेज आई एम वेरी हैप्पी कि हम बिल्कुल अच्छी स्पीड से जा रहे हैं मैंने कोशिश की है मैं इसे ज्यादा स्पीड से पढ़ सकूं लेकिन मुझे नहीं लगता कि मैं इसे ज्यादा स्पीड से कवर कर सकता हूं मैं ट्वेंटी पेजेस पर आर पढ़ सकता हूं थ्री मिनट्स लगते हैं एक पेज को पढ़ने में इससे तेज मेरे से तो नहीं पढ़ा जाता और मैं ख्याल अपने समझ भी नहीं आएगा शायद बट एनी अगली दो क्लासेस में डेफिनेटली विल बी डन आखिरी क्लास के बाद हम जरा लंबी डिस्कशन रखेंगे और उसके बाद शायद आप लोगों को इस बात का इलम हो मैंने अगली किताब की रीडिंग गलबन सेवनटीन से रखी है और वो है डिसिप्लिन एजाइल की किताब जो पीएमआई की रिकमेंडेड है या पीएमआई की अपनी पब्लिकेशन है उसका नाम है क्रिएटिंग दी वाओ वो देखिएगा अगर आपका इंटरेस्ट हो तो मेरे ख्याल में मेरे लिए तो बड़ी इंपॉर्टेंट है कि मैं वो किताब पढ़ूँ और आपको भी सुना दूंगा इसी बहाने मतलब मेरा सेल्फिश इंटरेस्ट है बेसिकली मैं आपको सुनाने के लिए नहीं पढ़ता मैं अपने आप पढ़ने के लिए पढ़ता हूँ बाकी आप लोग भी सुन लेंगे तो आपका भी कुछ शायद फायदा हो जाए तो ये बेसिक चीज है जी ओके जी थैंक यू वेरी मच आज का सेशन काफी मेरे ख्याल में तो अच्छा रहा आपकी आप लोग ज्यादा बेहतर जानते और समझते हैं सो लेट्स मीट टूमारो थैंक यू वेरी मच एंड टेक केयर खुदाफिज